Well, hello again. It is time for Sunday morning services once more, and we are doing the best we can. Uh, this Sunday was actually supposed to be our annual meeting, and it's very hard to have a meeting when we're not meeting, but it still is a really wonderful time every year that we have this, not only to vote for our budget and our new commissions, but just to celebrate what it means to be a Christian community. And um, so the vote has finished by now, I guess. And as, as of when we're recording this, we hadn't received any no votes. So hopefully if you had a no vote, you've expressed that voice by now. But um, beyond any of the voting part of the annual meeting, it's just really nice to have a chance to, to celebrate what it means to be with one another, even though we can't be with one another right now. And uh, I've actually been experiencing that in an interesting way this week. I have been feeling still close to God and, um, you know, nothing in some ways has changed about my relationship with God, but at the same time, something has felt missing in my relationship with him. And I've realized it's the part of my relationship with him that I learn about through being with other followers and through watching how they live their lives, how you live your lives, I should say. And um, from processing with you, from praying with you, from, from just sharing life with you, that there are things that I learn about God from from all of you as well. And that's a beautiful thing, but it also makes me realize how much I'm missing that at the moment. And so I wanted to just take some time to talk a little bit about that today. And we've got three uh, different stories to share as well, four folks sharing, but three stories um, about how they are also experiencing this moment and what it means to be in Christian community. So we'll get to them in just a moment. I've got them waiting in the wings eagerly. But uh, this has made me think about the passage from 1 Corinthians 12, which is describing what it means to be in the body of Christ. And it says, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13 and 25 to 27 says, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. But God has so arranged the body that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. I think the thing that made me think of this passage this week was the experience of, of suffering alone and also rejoicing alone. Uh, it says here, one member suffers, all suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all rejoice with it. And it reminded me of a proverb. I had to Google it. Apparently, it's a Swedish proverb. Shared joy is double joy. Shared sorrow is half a sorrow. And I think that's what I'm feeling at the moment, that my joy I have to hold to myself. There are some things happening at the moment that I'm actually really excited about and really thankful for, ways that I'm having conversations with people, ways that I'm seeing people come to God in new ways that make me so excited and resonate with my own experiences of God. And it's so hard for me to keep all that to myself. It's so hard for me to have to carry that excitement and that joy in myself and not share it with the community as much as I normally would. And also uh, when there's a sorrow or a grief, we're all experiencing those things at the moment to, sh to somehow share those things actually halves them. And I don't know about you, but that's my experience that when I share something I'm happy about, it seems to double. And when I share something I'm sad or anxious about it seems to have and that's such a beautiful reality it makes no sense really but I have experienced that in the family of God as well um, one thing that I found really helpful is is reading about family systems because they relate to families but they also relate to churches and uh, one book that I've read that's about family systems says that we need to both be separate and together as human beings we, uh, we need to have still a sense that I am a person and I am separate from other people, but at the same time, we need somehow to feel like we belong to something bigger than ourselves. And we often go to extremes with this. Imagine eggs, for example, if each one of us was an egg, go with me here. <laughs> um, we were butterflies a, a week or so ago, now we're eggs, so it's very Eastery. So imagine if we're each eggs, and uh, if we want to go to one extreme, we want to just be separate. We would just be these, these hard shelled eggs rolling around individually on a countertop without any connection to anything else. But then on the other hand, uh, some of us have a tendency to go to the opposite extreme of 
being eggs that are like beaten together in a bowl that have no separate distinction at all whatsoever that have lost their own identity and so the ideal then is for us to be eggs that still have an identity but are in an egg carton that we still share something together that we are a carton of eggs but we still are individual eggs not beaten all together so that we lose our own individual shape and i see uh, how this is even related to this body metaphor in the scripture passage that we can be hyper independent and want to just be by ourselves if you imagine the eye in our body saying i can see everything by myself why do i need anybody else and trying to roll around by itself it's kind of gross to imagine an eye rolling around by itself but before long the eye would begin to understand that it actually needs the mouth because the nourishment that whatever an eye needs to continue being healthy has to come through the mouth and through the digestive system and through the blood system and all the rest that it's so it's so dependent on those other things. And you can imagine the opposite extreme as well, that if an eye was like, well, you know, I, other parts of the body, I wish I was like a mouth, it can taste and it can talk and it can do all these other cool things. If an eye just kind of like, lost its identity then suddenly the whole body would be missing something as well and so um it's kind of a strange metaphor both the eggs one and the eye the body one um but the body one actually is from scripture so um i guess that's okay for it to be strange but the fact is that christian community um is something that invites us into this exploration of what it means to be an individual person but at the same time to be in a community with other people. We don't lose our total identity, but at the same time, we, uh, we uh, allow ourselves to be connected to one another, to need one another. And that's surprisingly um, scary. And it's a vulnerable thing to let yourself need other people and to let them need you as well. And I actually think at the moment, because so many of us are kind of disenfranchised or living away from our original communities, we are, we talk about community so much that it almost can become an idol. And uh, so we don't want to go there at all. We also don't want to go to a place of being flippant about community. I think that Christian community can become an idol because it points us to something really powerful, something that shows us who God is. And so of course, Christian community is not perfect. It's messy and we get it wrong. And even in those experiences, we learn something about ourselves and one another and about God. And so I hope that as we are exploring this while we're apart, we are able to remember something when we come back together, that the way that each of you lives out your faith, even if it's messy, even if it's complicated, even if you don't always understand what you're doing, the way each one of you is living out that faith and asking questions and making mistakes and exploring and sharing joys and asking for prayer and having needs and serving others, all of those ways that we have to live out our faith are actually helping others live out their faith and not only that when we're all doing this together we're communicating something unique to this community to broader cincinnati community and to the uc community because of how we're all letting our lives become this christian community here at ucc so uh, I hope that if that's something you're already a part of, that you will continue to explore that in new ways, that if this is not something you're already engaged in, that you, when we can be back together, that we can, um, that we can explore it in even deeper ways than we've already explored it. Um, and this, this wraps in, I'll say this and then we'll get to our testimonies. This wraps into Easter in beautiful ways for me as well, because we, we see the body of Jesus is such a central piece to the story. And um, God became a human person and walked around and, and experienced and uh, expressed God's own personality and God's truth and God's love through one human body. And then this kind of miraculous thing takes place that Jesus says himself, you are going to be able to do much more than I could ever do because my spirit is going to be in you. And so what an amazing possibility that Christ's body now is not one human who can only be in one place at a time, but a community of human beings all over the world who even in 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 imperfect ways are expressing what it means to live like Jesus. There's a way that then when we come into the body of Christ, we come into a body, we come into a community, we experience God all around us because we can experience being surrounded by the people of God. And that's such a beautiful thing. We are in Christ. We are not just rattling around independently, but we can be connected to, to one another and to him in a way that shows us how we can belong. 
and that's a transformative experience. So I've invited a few folks to share what this all means to them. I shared this passage with them. I asked them, how are you experiencing this current crisis? Uh, I've asked people who are from different kind of stages of life so that they can also share how it might be looking different for each one of them. So I've got Andrew Goggle here and Connie and Randy and also Emily Hill. And they are um, going to share with you. I won't interrupt them again. I'll just let them go um, one after the other and then I'll jump back on at the very end to wrap things up. So um, we're going to begin with with Emily and then go to Andrew and then Connie and Randy will close things up for us. So thank you folks for, for sharing. Okay. Um, well, I think like all of you, uh, this is not the April that I had planned. <laughs> um, this past year has been full of a lot of transitions for me or like one long multiple transitions. Um, I finished my PhD about a year ago and then have been trying for the last year to figure out what to do next. And this month I was gonna finally move out of my parents' house and start a campus ministry position that I'd been raising money for, or raising support for. Um, so I have of course not moved out of my parents' house. Um, and, and honestly, as much as I really wanted to do that, um, I'm really thankful that I haven't because I know that for me it would be really hard if I was living alone right now. Um, and I know that's something that's really difficult for a lot of single people right now that are struggling with that. Um, and I think it's really important just to say that being single does not equal being lonely. Um, and I experience uh, my singleness in a very positive way, though there are difficult things about it. Um, I have a lot of rich friendships with all kinds of people and God has given me a lot of experiences that I could never have imagined. Um, and I also think singleness is a very theologically significant thing. Um, and I'll spare you the whole sermon on that for now. But, um, but uh, this situation does highlight the more difficult things about it just because it does cut off those um, other relationships and activities that are fulfilling that are not necessarily in the household in which you are, or which I'm quarantined. Um, but I am very thankful, like I said, that I am living with my parents and I'm close with them. So that is helping me. Um, but I know a lot of other people who um, are not in that situation. Um, I was able to start the campus ministry um, position still. <laughs> um, it's, I'm doing it all online like we all are. Um, and so that's obviously not what I expected either. Um, and that feels difficult relationally as well because I'm trying to start something where I have no existing relationships. The ministry exists, but I don't, I'm new and I have very little existing relationships. So I feel pretty much helpless to support people. Um, so I guess the similarity in both those cases is the way in which I think about relationships or building community is uh, taken away, which I think is, you know, similar for everybody, but just a different, you know, circumstances. So um, one verse that keeps coming to mind for me that I wanted to share is from Isaiah 43, 19, when God said to his people, see, I am doing a new thing. And I think we like that verse because um, it's a great promise and uh, it's in the future, but it's also in the present. Um, but that's written to God's people when they are in exile and in the wilderness. And um, there's a lot of periods in scripture and in history when God's people are in the wilderness and typical ways in which they related to God and to each other have been stripped away and they have to go back to the basics or cling to what they know. And God always reminds them that he is at work and that he is always speaking. And the, the verse continues, now it springs up, do you not perceive it? And so in the midst of the desert or the chaos that we're feeling, um, we have to learn to look for what God is doing or look for community um, in different ways. And um, again, he promises in that verse, I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. So I've just been really trying to look for those things in different ways. And 
um, you know, rely on the spirit and what, when things are obviously always out of our control, but just in very apparent ways out of our control at this point. Um, so one community that's been really important for me in this season has been the Lectio Divina group that we do on Thursdays and Fridays. Um, so just a little plug for that. You guys should all join. <laughs> um, but it's made up of some university students, UCC members, various people who kind of find out about it and are connected. And um, that's been a real highlight for me. Just, I always feel like the spirit breaks through in that in really powerful ways. And this week, even people were just sharing how that group has been really significant for them. So um, I've just been kind of making notes throughout the month uh, and putting them in an envelope, all the different ways that I've seen God speaking and acting through people even um, in this season. And I kind of look forward to going back uh, at some point in the future <laughs> to see what all those ways have been, so. Hey guys, it is really an honor to be here. Um, my, my name is Andrew. My wife, Lindsay, and I are also trying to figure out this work from home reality, and we have a five-month-old, so it's um some days are hard some days are good and it always feels like every day is the same and every day is different so we um are both trying to figure out how to do our jobs how to work around nap times and those can be anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour and a half and so the lack of control and the lack of predictability has been just a huge challenge for us in this season. And we're just tired at the end of every day. And, you know, there's some really nice things. Like it's really good that Hunter, our five month old can be on some video calls with me and he gets to kind of hang out for a lot of the day with both of us in different ways. And um, it's been interesting. Cause I think while a lot of people talk about, Oh, this is an opportunity for, all this time that we have to do all these things and to rest and disconnect from things and recharge. And, and it's, I've had to process some resentment about that because it's like definitely not been my experience that we've been able to rest or recharge in this season. And we were joking about kind of just wanting a vacation after all this is over because we need some kind of break. And so I've been trying to think, think about as we go, um, how to get through, how to get through this season, whatever that means. And the story or the image that keeps coming up for me is the story of Noah and the ark. Because all of us are trapped in this little box while there's a, a, a global flood or pandemic happening at the same time that is literally rewriting kind of the world that we know. And uh, man, what I'm tempted to do is just to say this will be over at some point. And so I'm going to put my head down and I'm going to numb out and coma through it and not in, really engage any of the stuff that's going on. Um, but that seems really unhealthy. And when I do things like coping with screens or scrolling through the news or social media or um, drinking or whatever it ends up being, and I, you know, you never feel better after that. Um, and that feels like this uh, choice to sort of disconnect until it all gets quote unquote back to normal. But then I was thinking, and it's like, I don't even really want it to go back to normal. I think the stuff that this is revealing in me is how much I want to see something transformed both in my life and in the world around us. It's like, do we really want to go back to feeling just as busy and overwhelmed and chaotic as we were before this? Um, and so I've started almost to dread when we go back to normal because of that, because I don't know if I really like normal. And so to connect it again to Noah, what I've been thinking about is I wonder for Noah, as the waters were starting to recede, if he was beginning to kind of daydream about the world and what it would look like and what it could be on the other side. And for me, that's evoked two things. That's both been interesting to start to long for that and hope for that but it provokes some grief in me as well as a recognition of the things that are beautiful as well so um because what happens is when we stop numbing our hearts and that we start to focus on letting them be then all of the sort of pain and joy gets mixed up together in there as well 
And so I think um, beauty and, and grief are two different things that help us to come alive because it evokes like longings within our hearts, whether that's unmet longings in the way that we hope the world could be, or whether that's unmet longings in the ways that we're disappointed that the world is different than we would hope it would be. I think that they're kind of two sides of the same coin. And so uh, a kind of pathway for me has been to try to not ignore those things, the longings that I feel, or the grief or the beauty that I encounter and to receive them as small gifts. And a couple stories just to illustrate some moments of that for me. There was a, a lot of walking that we try to do. And really there's a couple windows in the day that we can go for walks and uh, sunset is one of them for me. And you walk and everyone's kind of out and about in our neighborhood, which has been a really sweet gift. And on one walk, there was this amazing sunset. Lindsay was like, just go for a walk by yourself. You need a break. And I said, okay. And uh, there was this amazing sunset just coming down kind of through the valley. And it was just beautiful. And I um, felt my heart responding to that in a meaningful way. And I just was restored by that because it was like something that was so great and it was real and it was in the moment and it wasn't distracting me from anything. It was very physical and present. And then on the walk back on the other side, on the east was the rising moon over the, the houses in Clifton as I looked down the valley the other direction. And I just had this amazing like sunset moonrise kind of moment and felt like there was something really peaceful about that that I enjoyed. And it was about just receiving that moment and, and appreciating it and it's like it's those kinds of small moments that I feel like have gotten me through other little things Lindsay and I went for another walk and we were walking back and there is this guy that we don't know on the porch of his house clearly talking to somebody on the phone and he just shouts out of us and he says hey have either of you guys showered today <laughs> and it was like I have and Lindsay was like I haven't <laughs> it was like that's normal <laughs> It's just funny, like we would never have talked to this guy, but because we're all in the same exact experience, we just had this cool connection moment or interaction. And now that guy's always going to be the guy that asked me if I took a shower that day. And uh, it's been really fun to see some of the ways that our community and our neighborhood has come alive like that. And um, another moment was, so we live in, in the same neighborhood as the Van Dorans and the Wyckoffs in our church and um, there's one evening where the Wyckoffs came over with their kids and they just picnicked in the front yard of our house and we were sitting up on the porch and so we were far enough away and they were kind of eating and hanging out and we were just able to talk to them and be with them and for me that was so meaningful because we would never have done that if in this season especially if we didn't live in the same neighborhood and then um, and on the rest of the world, if, it, if we weren't in this pandemic, we probably would have had a million things to do in the evening and this kind of spontaneous picnic wouldn't have happened. And it was this really beautiful moment of connection and being with the people who you're close to. And even just today, I, I was holding Hunter at the back door and it was raining and we were watching the rain and I can see in the caravan or in his kitchen through our backyards and she was there and we like waved at each other. <laughs> through the rain and it's just these little moments of connection that I think for me it's like man I wish all of our lives we could experience that those kinds of levels of connection and then you get sad because it's the the part of me that realizes how hard it is in normal life to create connection and to feel like you're really being um, with other people and so I think that's something that I want to hold on to is I think about the Noah thing it's for me it's how do I create in this season? How do I embrace this season as a um, period of refinement and of beginning to allow my heart to long for something new? And I think that's the resurrection as well, that um, we're obviously waiting for the, in the fullness of time, Jesus to make all things new. And so I think anything that within my heart can begin to long for the world that it's going to be starts to help me appreciate and live into that story more and more in this life as well. And so I think it's like, for me, how do I ask the question of other people and how can people be asking me? It's like, how's your heart doing? And what, what are you longing for? What are you experiencing that's beautiful? What are you grieving? And that pulls us out of the kind of numbness of, of just hoping that this season passes us by and begins to allow us to really embrace it and let it do something in us as we kind of turn away from death and move towards feeling in life in a new way.
And so for me, that's what I've been learning. And I've been thankful for a lot of things in this season, but they've also been obviously really hard. So again, trying to just move through it and, and believe that the future life that is coming both in Jesus and after this pandemic are going to be better than, um, than right now. Thank you. Um, so how has this time of social distancing been affecting us? Well, we were already experiencing uh, a major disruption. Uh, we had been serving overseas and we came in conflict with someone in our agency. And the process of that conflict uh, revealed some uh, deep weaknesses in our relationship with each other. Um, we just, we see things so differently and there's nothing like a conflict with somebody else to bring that out and kind of force us in, in opposite directions. So we came home to address those issues? We had only been in um, our new country for about 10 months. We went there after we retired. And so we were, we were in a new situation, but it didn't work out. It was, it was very hard. And so we came back to try to figure out like what went wrong. And that was personal, it was, with, it was with us. And then with these other people, one of the things that became very obvious to me during that time was that I had a lot of grieving to do and when we came back from a particular meeting out of town in early February, it was very obvious that we were not ready to go back, but we didn't quite know what we needed. Yeah, so, so we had... No, no, that's when you say yeah. God gave us the pandemic oh, and yeah, that's yeah, what okay. we needed. Yeah. Yeah. So we didn't know what we were shooting at already. You know, it's like how healthy is healthy enough. And then, so we get a pandemic and, and the doors to going back are closed. And so now it's like, well, when will the world be healthy enough? So now, you know, if, if it was kind of vague and formless before, it's so much more so now. So fuzzy goals, unknown timeline, and that's, you know, what we've been, been living in. One of the blessings was that before we went out of town for the meeting that went so bad, um, a friend of mine um, gave me a key to her house and said, if you ever need a place to stay, you can stay with me. And I kind of went, well, that's nice, but we're going back. <laughs> so when we realized we were not going to go back, I made a phone call and we have been at Joe Heckinger's on the West side ever since. And that has just been, that's a blessing every day. And um, we can be with her during this trying time when all her outside activities are canceled. And we can help her deal with her, or minister to her 97 year old mother, who also lives here, who has dementia. Mm -hmm. Just an added, uh, aspect to our lives here. Yeah. So um, how are we um, experiencing Christian community and how are we experiencing resurrection in that? Well, um, so our primary community now is, is with Joe at uh, the, the place um, where, where we're staying. And so we just get the chance 
to serve one another. And one really neat thing is, so when, when we saw what was coming now with COVID-19 and things starting to close down, we said to her, uh, we think we had best leave because the more people in your house, the greater the risk to your mom. And she, she said, no, she said, no, the, the, the invitation is open to you. It's, it's great to have you here. So, you know, her, her trust in us and her trust in, in our community um, was, was something that is, is really, really meaningful and just speaks mm -hmm. of, of a, of a, a larger reality. So that's been one um, really great uh, thing, just to be able to be here and uh, experience this time together, um, listen to the governor and or <laughs> others um, uh, say what's going on and uh, just, just have that experience and have it together. Yeah. Um, the other uh, main thing that's going on at going on right now with us is the making of masks. Um, uh, this is definitely um, a community um, activity. Um, I was spurred onto this by Sarah Bowman and my sister-in-law um, as something to do and it's been an excellent, very therapeutic activity for me. I'm using um, Sarah's fabric. So I actually haven't gone out and bought a bunch of stuff. This is all stuff that um, she gave to me to go through. Um, I've also accessed three different sewing machines um, from um, Bethany Judd and Kara Van Doren and um, Jen Underhill. So. I haven't burned through all of the machines, but they've each had their own place in this. And then um, the other thing that's been a reflection of Christian community is the people to give the masks to. Um, uh, people that used to attend UCC, but now live in New York City in, um, high risk areas. Um, I have, we have sent two different packages of 50 or 60 more. or more, yeah, um, masks for them to give out within their community. And um, Marco Saavedra and Amber Bennett. And so it's been really neat to see God provide materials, time, and relationships to get um, a little bit of care and hope um, expressed. Mm -hmm. So, and we've um, collaborated on a little tag that we put on all of these. Now, I know this is showing up backwards, um, but that says you matter. And that expresses Connie's heart for these people that someone sees them and knows what they're going through and cares for them. And the other part is from me. It's also reflects love and care, but it's in a different dialect. It says, always treat mask Don't like it's shaking. contaminated and wash in soap and water. So we, we've got that. We've got that. Yeah, we, we have together. very complimentary um, ways of looking at the world. Yeah. yeah. Counselors. So, so um, yeah, we, we also have been experiencing Christian community um, through through some counseling, one counselor in in particular, and um, you know she is always um, calling forth um, transformation and resurrection in us, calling forth um, the, the the presence of Christ in each of us, and as we as we see see one another, and um, and so we are experiencing that that transformation and that's that's been been great yeah we um celebrated our 38th wedding anniversary um about a month ago and it has been very humbling to admit that some of the problems that came out um, on the field actually started 
before we even got married. Um, and so I want, I want to admit and I want to um, encourage all you um, to join us in um, being willing to look at your fears. Seems like fear is really at the bottom of all of this stuff going on right now. Um, the angst, the worry that, that we kind of feel every day. Um, God doesn't want us to sit with those. He wants us to give them to him and to trust him with it. I would say in a new way. And so by feeling some of those, for me, feelings of betrayal or being left out or what's the other one I forget now. <laughs> oh, anyways, um, it's really important. I can't remember. Anyways, um, these deep seated fears that yielding our lives and our perception of our lives to God is really how we trust him. And so thinking about dying alone, thinking about your business going under, losing relatives, God has said he's going to be with us. Mm -hmm. I will never leave you or forsake you. And that's, that's what we're trying on in this season. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, all of you, for being willing to share so transparently. And um, I just love that trying on, trying on that possibility that God has not forsaken us, that God will never leave us. What if that's really true? And I think there are ways we can try that on with one another in Christian community as well, that if, if I really trust that God has given me this community of other believers, that he can show through them how he will never forsake me. Um, and not, that's not to say it's perfect, of course, even in the ways that we mess up, even in the ways we get it wrong, there are things that we can learn that, that maybe collide with our fears, as you said, um, Connie, that even those places where our fears are triggered, then something new can be released and some new freedom can come as we die to those fears, as you said. So one thing that we are doing as a staff and that I would encourage all of you to do as well, it can be a little bit overwhelming to try to replace a whole Christian community when we can't be together. And so we've just committed that whenever somebody comes to mind, if we just kind of assume that the spirit is prompting us, when we're thinking of someone that we're missing right now, or we're just wondering how they're doing, that's a sign that we should reach out to them. And uh, whether it's by text or call or email or social media or however you want to do that, um, to just be having those, you know, we don't want church to be top down. We want it to be sideways. And so that's up to you to be reaching out and, and letting people know that you're thinking of them. And at the same time, um, sometimes it's harder to actually say when I feel a need, that's also a prompt to reach out. I think it's easier sometimes to save, to serve others than to ask others to help us. But at this time when we can't see one another, when we can't say, oh, that person wasn't at church on Sunday, I hope they're okay. We actually need to trust one another to that, that others want to know when we need something. And that's a really vulnerable thing to say, I need help. I've lost I've lost income or I'm lonely or I'm feeling sick or I'm anxious. Um, we really need you to, to share that with one another as well. Um, and in this way, then we, we learn how much we need one another. We learn how much we need God and uh, we learn to belong to one another and to him in new ways too. So thank you for being a part of this time together, my friends. It's been so good to see all your faces and hear your stories. And I'm deeply blessed by this little gathering here. And I can't wait to, until the rest of the community gets to hear the stories as well. But uh, be well and go in peace. Thank you.